be ye ready is no joking matter, is my message. I want you to go to Matthew 24, please. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Be ye ready is no joking matter. I'm going to show you where I got this message in a few moments. I'll show you how it came about. Matthew 24. Let's begin to read verse 42. Begin to read at verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord has come. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in, that, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, would have not suffered his house to be broken in. Therefore be ye also ready. Would you repeat that line with me, please? Therefore be ye also ready. All right? For in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh, who then is a faithful and wise servant, and his Lord hath made rule of his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Heavenly Father, I believe that you're sending your angels soon to gather your elect from the four winds. The coming of the Lord is drawing nigh. Lord, you spoke so clear to me this past week in a dream. And I'm going to share that dream in just a moment. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you awaken our hearts. You awakened me in a new way. And you told me to preach this this afternoon, and I obey you. Lord, I don't know who you sent here. I don't know why you sent them. Lord, this is for many that attend this church. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you awaken us. You love us. You're our Heavenly Father. But, Lord, you, you mean business. Your word is no joke. It's not a laughing matter. Lord, you are not delaying your coming. Your coming, you said, as a thief in the night. But that night is not to overtake us. We're to be wide awake. So, Holy Ghost, come now upon me. Let the Spirit of the Lord rest upon me. Let every word I speak be to the glory and honor of God. Oh, Holy Spirit, quicken my message, I pray. Quicken this word. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. Lord, those who are not ready, prepare them. God, convict them. Lord, if you have to shake them. Lord, I don't care if you have to let them sink down in their seats. Whatever you have to do, do it, Lord. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me tell you why I'm preaching this particular message at this time. I had an unusual dream last Tuesday night. Now, the Bible does say... In Acts 2.17, in the last days, the old men shall dream dreams. I qualify. In all seriousness, I qualify. I don't get many dreams, and I don't preach on my dreams because I'm a Bible preacher. And you know that we've taught you here that anything that does not conform to the Word of God is to be rejected outright. And I'm telling you right now, this is not on the, my dream has nothing to do with theology. It has nothing to do with some great biblical truth as far as amplifying it, other than to make it clear what Jesus is saying. And I'm just telling you how God awakened my soul, how He awakened my spirit, that I should preach this more often. And I want, I'm going to share that with you just a moment, but before I do, well, I want you to know that this is not doctrine, it's not some new revelation, it's simply the Holy Spirit, was the Spirit of God prompting me and speaking to me about His coming. I don't want to build any doctrine about it, remember that. I don't have much confidence in dreams, and any dream, vision, or, new, or so-called revelation has to absolutely be framed in the Scripture. We are Bible believers in this church. Now, having said that, let me share with you, without trying to talk about a doctrine or anything else, just the Holy Ghost speaking to me. In my dream, I was suddenly awakened by the knowledge that I had been snatched. I had been caught up, and I was in some kind of a conveyance. I don't know whether it was a chair, and I didn't see the conveyance. But I knew that there were others in this and that there was an angel of the Lord 
that was, and there was a sense of just racing swiftly through streets and in, into houses, that this conveyance knew no barriers. And I had a sense that I'm, I'm on my way home. I'm saved. The Lord has come. I am being gathered by the angels of the Lord. The chariots of the Lord are thousands upon thousands. The coming of the Lord is as, as lightning is from the east and to the west. And there, there was a sense of swiftness, but it was almost though I would see it in slow motion, this lightning coming, I was seeing it in slow motion. I didn't see a driver, didn't see an angel. I didn't see the conveyance. I just had a sense. I knew I was being carried and taken. And it was moving swiftly, and, and people were being snatched from homes and from the streets. And I remember specifically going into a particular home, and we were we swiftly, and there were three people that I recognized. Two were friends, and one was a family member. And we went right by. And, and there was a sense, a, a sudden sense, oh, God, they're being left behind. And the Lord allowed me to, for a few fleeting moments, to, to sense the terror of what it would be like to be left behind when the angels of the Lord go and gather his elect from the four winds. The sense I, I was made to know at that time that even though those who called themselves Christians and were really not Christians who despised the grace of God, misused and flagrantly flaunted the grace of God, went out and sinned and said, I can easily confess, and never did forsake their sins, there was a sense that even though they were sleeping, they were aware. There was an awareness that they, that Lord has, is coming, and there's a sudden moment because I saw hands being raised, people reaching out and waving. In fact, as, as we kept moving on, I, there were people that were sense waving, hey, and, and trying to get attention to this, this uh, driver and this conveyance, and I was screaming and yelling, get out in the open, get out in the open. And people were trying to get away from the crowd, so get away from the crowd, get out. As if, I, I thought if they were out in the open, they could be seen and caught up, but we, it went swiftly on. But there was a sense that I have never experienced in my life, even though all my lifetime, my father taught on the coming of the Lord, my grandfather taught about it. The Bible says we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye suddenly. We're going to be changed, the Bible says. This corrupt body shall put on an incorrupt body, just like his. And the Bible says that we're to be prepared and ready, expecting. He said it's coming for those who look for his appearing. And those who are expecting, even though they sleep, they're going to be caught. It's in the middle of the night. Now, I'm not going to get into the doctrine of the rapture. I'm not going to get doctrine. When, when, when this happens, before the tribulation, mid-tribulation, or after the tribulation, I am just telling you that I had a sense of the horror it's going to be for those who knew the gospel, who had one appeal after another, who knew the grace and the mercy of God, and they were not ready. They were not taken. They were not gathered in this. And I remember the swiftness of moving, and I, I was thinking, if you were surely going this street, going down this street, uh, if you could just rush over here, and I'd see people racing, trying to get where they were visible in this uh, conveyance, this passing by, and this terrible sense, Lord, I know I'm saved, I know I'm redeemed, I'm going home, but those three, those two friends, and that member of my family, and there was a terror. Two shall be sleeping in the bed, one shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, you never know. He's coming as a thief in the night. He's coming. Folks, there was no sense of speed. There's no sense of travel. Nothing at all. But suddenly, it was like coming out of a cloud. And suddenly, I was stepping with everyone around me. We were stepping as out of a cloud, out of a fog, out of time into eternity. Suddenly. There was no sense of being carried out into a cosmos or anywhere else. Suddenly, we were home. We, we were in eternity. And there was, I, I remember 
the sense that I have the absolute serenity as we stepped out into eternity through this cloud, there was a sense of peace. And all I could see around me, people were feeling their bodies. They were feeling their hands, and they were caressing their faces, looking at their hands. There was no shouting. I didn't see Jesus anywhere. It was just a sense. It happened so quickly. It seemed to be a gathering place. The Bible said he's going to gather his uh, elect from the four winds. And suddenly I looked, and there were my two friends and my loved one coming through the cloud. And into eternity. Nobody was looking at each other. Nobody was, there was no embracing, there was nothing. There was just a peace, an incredible peace. And I experienced it for a moment. I am home. That earth that I was on is gone. I'm beyond the reach of Satan. There is no sin. There is no possibility of ever being lost. I am eternally his. He did what he said he would do. There was a sense he said he would come with his angels. He came with his angels. He did everything I preached, everything I said. It's true. He's all sufficient. He's everything that we need. There was a peace and a serenity beyond anything I could imagine. And people were, were just awed. There, there was an awe. There was, there was a peace that was absolutely indescribable. And a sense of, this is a new body. Nobody was looking at anybody else's body. I was not going to any loved one or relative or anything else. It was a sense. It was just that sense. It's all over. It's all over. It was all, it was all true. That sense of reality and truth, that was not the real world. This is the real world. This is eternity. That's all passed away. It was just, a dream, Mike. It's just grass. That's what the Bible says. Flesh is just grass. It comes up and it withers and it's gone. It's the Lord. The world was created. Each time was just a little piece. Eternity is a great big round cord, so to speak. Jesus, or God put, cut a little piece out called time and he gave it to man with his grace and mercy. And he said, here is my mercy, my glory, my grace. He gives you space and time to repent and trust in him. But then... I remember in this serenity, saying, but God, wait a minute. All of those who didn't come, all of those who were left behind, who thought they were, they were prepared and thought they were ready, they are not here. What about them, Lord? They're lost. There was a sense in me. Now, folks, that will not be there, but I believe God was, was letting me feel the sense of this lostness of those who, who were gone and I, 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 suddenly, as I was thinking about all those who had not been gathered, I woke up. I, I sat right up. And I, I, I said, this is the, the, the most incredible dream I've ever had in my life. And these words were like silent thunder in my head. David, be ye ready is no joking matter. And I laid back in the pillow, and God said, David, my people are not taking it seriously. They are not taking, they talk about it, but they're not taking it seriously. The way they're living, they are not taking it seriously. And many, many are going to be left behind. They are not ready. I said, well, Lord, what about all this grace I've been preaching, all this mercy I've been preaching, about your glory? I've been telling everybody that your glory is your grace, your mercy, your tenderness, your long-suffering. And Lord said, I am love, I am grace, I'm mercy, I'm tender-hearted, I'm long-suffering. But David, the day of grace is about to end. It's all going to end. I gave grace, mercy, and tenderness to bring men to the realization that I am bringing them into a new world. There's a new world coming. We're not living for this world. There has to be an awakening. God calls his grace all-sufficient. But when he says all-sufficient, he doesn't mean all-sufficient just to let you, let you egg your way through life. It's not just to keep you from having a nervous breakdown. It's not so you can just cope with life. His grace is all-sufficient that he prepares you for an eternal home with him. His grace is to take you not just through life, but through eternity. 
that there has to be a preparation for that time. Now, I'm not the judge of the Lord's church. I'm not the judge of his church. But I honestly believe that God looks down on a church that's fast asleep. He's looking down right now on a church that is unconcerned about his soon coming. Jesus himself said, while the bridegroom carried, they all slumbered and slept. They all slumbered. All the virgins slumbered and slept. You go to any town in America, any city, go to almost any church of any denomination, any Sunday morning, and take a look at the crowd. The crowd is bored. They're counting the minutes on their watch till the man is finished so they can get back to their football games or back to their pleasure or back to their vacation homes. There's nothing of God. There's nothing of expectancy. Nothing about the coming of the Lord. Not a thought. In the majority of churches in America today. And why is it that so many of our people are hard now? Empty. Unexcited about going to church. I, I've heard Christians I read letters from Christians said the worst thing in the world is to get up every Sunday morning and dread going to church. Just dread going to church. Now that's not in times for a church, I can assure you. But why are so many people mixed up in their morals, so lacking in discernment that they buy any doctrine that comes down a turnpike, so complacent, earthbound? Why is their love for Jesus growing cold? Why is it? It's because the pastors, first of all, and the shepherds themselves are asleep. That's what the Bible says. The shepherds are asleep. You go to any mountaintop, you go to any grazing place where the where sheep are grazing, you show me a shepherd that's sleeping in the natural, you show me an unconcerned shepherd, one who's always slumbering, sleeping, and I'll show you one that I'll show you a flock that's scattered everywhere, going its own way, and a prey to every wolf and every wild animal within sight. I want you to go to Isaiah 56. The Bible says the tapping our churches today is because of sleeping pastors. I'll get to the congregation before I'm finished. Isaiah 56. Let's look at verse 9, beginning to read. All ye beasts of the field, come to devour all ye beasts in the forest. Now look at me, folks. Here's an invitation to every wild beast, every demon power. Here's an absolute invitation. Come on in. Take advantage of the sheep. Come on in. Take advantage of the flock. Go anywhere, do anything, because there's no shepherd on guard. Read the next one. Because the shepherds, his watchmen are blind. They're ignorant, dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. They're greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they're shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one to his gain from his own quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. Listen to it. Blind watchmen with no message, no urgency, no heart cry, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber, shepherds that cannot understand. Folks, when you have... Shepherds of a congregation to come to the pulpit without a word from God and feeding the people straw and not grass, not milk. There's nothing. They've not heard from God. The Bible said they're blind. They're asleep. They're sitting in front of their TV sets, many of them. They have no life. They have no power. And they stand there because it's a job. They're a hireling, the Bible says. Folks, this is, this is so widespread, and that's why we have a backslidden nation. That's why we have churches that are closing their doors because there is not a shepherd in the pulpit. There's not a man of God that's been on his knees and stands broken before the people knowing they're going to hell, knowing that Jesus is coming. They themselves are blind to have no word from heaven. The Bible said they're slumbering. They're, they're interested only in their own gain. All I hear from many pastors today, I can't wait till I'm 65 to retire. I want five acres, and I want a little place out in the country, and I've had it. And they'll sit many in front of their TV sets and waste away and lose any anointing they once had. And what a sad, sad thing. Every prophet in the Bible prophesies against it. However, 
in spite of blind, sleeping pastors, in spite of dead, dry, slumbering churches, the Bible said we as individuals are going to have to answer to God. You will not be able on the judgment day to blame a dead, dry church. You will not be able to blame some slumbering pastor who's spiritually blind. No, because you own a Bible. It's in your house. You have every opportunity to get into this Word and get to know Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit dealing with you. You have heard the gospel. You've heard it time and time again. So the Bible says that we are without excuse. Without excuse. In Revelation, the 19th chapter, don't turn to Revelation 19, 7. Listen to this. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. This is the body of Christ. The bride of Christ has made herself ready. In verse 9, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are those who are going to be called and gathered. The angels are going to gather this elect to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he's not coming for a bride that's asleep. He's not coming for one of those. He's not coming for a bride that's careless. He's not coming for a bride spotted and wrinkled in garment. He's coming for those who are looking, anticipating, fully prepared, not surprised, and not having to be shaken out of a deep slumber. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Those are the words of the Lord. And to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Unto them that look for him. Now, if you truly love Jesus this afternoon, this has to be the cry of your heart. Lord, what does the scripture tell me to do to get ready? What, what, what do I have to do to know that I am ready? First of all, I, I'm going to go over just three things. There are many, many things, but three things that the Holy Spirit laid in my heart as I lay on that bed on Tuesday night. First of all, go to Colossians 3. Third chapter of Colossians. Boy, how clear this is. There's no question about it. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. Folks, before we go into Colossians, the first, the third chapter of Colossians, let me tell you what it is. You've got to get your eyes focused on Jesus and get your eyes off of everything that's in this world. You have got to absolutely focus your time, your attention on Jesus and his eternal purposes. Verse 1 to 3, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. You know what he's saying? Look at me. If when Jesus comes, he's your life, you're going to go with him. Is he your life? Not your career, not your job. Now, my Bible makes it clear that if you don't provide for your own household, you're worse than an infidel. My Bible tells me if you don't work, you don't eat. My Bible tells me that God loves to bless those who are, who are sincere and dedicated in their work, their ministry, their call. Whatever your job is, whatever your career, whatever your work God's called you to do, you're to do it with diligence. You're to lay in store for your children, in fact, the Bible. It's all outlined clearly. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the things that consume your time. That is your life, whatever it consumes your time. Some of you can't even know. Some of you men can't even quote me the chapter. You can't even name the books in the Bible. But you know every basketball player, you know every football player, his weight and his height and what team he's in, how much he makes. You tell me Jesus is your life? You tell me Christ is your life? When you have time for friends, for family, for relatives, you have no time to dig into the Word of God, you have no time to pray and seek the face of God, and you tell me Christ is your life?
If Christ is your life and he appears, you will also appear with him. The Bible says, though, that it is very possible and very likely that when you are prospered, that you will want things bigger, better, larger, and more. Jezreel waxed fat and forgot God. Jerusalem, Israel was prospered and blessed and forgot God. If you're here now in this building and you're being blessed and God is prospering you, it's a time to humble yourself before God. It's a time to say, God, this is my most, most vulnerable time because the enemy will use this. He will try to come in and try to drive me deeper into debt. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Listen to this, Pastor. I've been on my knees and I know there's a storm coming and I'm telling you now, stay out of debt. If you don't hear anything else I'm saying, stay out of debt. Don't go into debt unless you're willing to lose it. Stay out of debt. The Bible talks about the deceitfulness of riches coming to choke out the word and you become unfruitful. You were fruitful. You were doing well, the Bible suggests. And then suddenly the, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for more and better, and that spirit of covetousness set in and things begin to take your mind and possessions begin to rule your, your thinking, the desire for things. That's why the Lord says, don't set your heart on the things of this world. But set your heart on me, Jesus said. I will be your life. If when the trumpet of God sounds, I am your focus. Yes, you may be busy. But night, every waking hour, it doesn't matter where you're at. You can be in a conference. You can be on the subway. You can be at your computer. But Jesus is always on the mind. Jesus is always on the mind. And there's a thought that says, oh, Lord, one of these days, this is all going to burn. This is not my life here, Lord. Thank you for this piece of furniture. Thank you for my car. Thank you for the finances you're supplying. But, oh, God, it's all going up in smoke very soon, Lord. You're my life. There are Christians all over the city who once attended this church. Some rich, some very rich, some not so rich. They used to be so on fire, they'd sit on the edge of the seat when I preached. They would come back and hug me. Man, they'd go back and they'd buy every tape I had and they couldn't get enough. They'd listen to their tapes on the way to work, whoever it was, and, and they were so excited about Jesus with this, they never missed the service. They're not here now. They go one service a week to a church that's dead and doesn't convict them of anything at all. And now they're wrapped up in their jobs, wrapped up in making money, and they're fast asleep. Fast asleep. They see me on the street and they go the other way. Because they look into my eyes and get convicted just saying hello. If you are risen with Christ, if you are his, seek him who sits on the right hand of God, then shall you appear with him in glory. Now the heart affection of the bride of Christ is described in Song of Solomon 10, but Song of Solomon 3, 1 and 2. By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loved. Now I'm telling, I'm talking about the kind of people who are going to be ready when Jesus comes. It's going to be those with a heart affection for him. It says looking for him. He's looking, looking for the one that is my life, the one that I love with everything in me. She said, by night in my bed I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now. I'll go about the city and in the streets and in Broadway. Oh, Broadway, right outside the door. I will seek him whom my soul loveth. Well, here's a seeking, searching heart that will not let go. It says, I will not let you go, Lord, until you possess me. 
If thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul, if you seek him, you will be, he will be found of you. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Not just occasionally, but continually. I'll tell you now, and I'll tell you with a broken spirit, this afternoon from this pulpit, some of you that are hearing me right now, you believe you're going to go and be in the bride, but according to Colossians 3, 1, I've just read, it's not possible because he is not your life. Because if Jesus Christ were your life, you would not miss a single day in this book. And it says, I went out and sought him. Here's how we seek him, right here in this book. You seek him. He's here. This is Christ, the living word, and you seek him. How can you say you're ready to be, to go with the Lord? Now, I'm not talking about missing a day or two, but you, your heart is set. And when you miss a day, you miss it and say, Lord, you know, I just, I, I couldn't do it today. But, oh, God, e even if you just open it, say, Lord, I need a precious word from you before I go to sleep. And I open it, Lord, there's something here. I need you. How can you tell me that you love him and you're ready to go and you neglect him day after day after day? Don't tell me you're going. You're not going. You're going to be left behind. You don't love him. You say, Brother Wilson, where is that mercy and grace? This is grace. This is mercy. Because we as pastors stand one day before a holy God. I stand before a judge. No man on earth can give me money and pay me to do what I'm doing. I stand one day and have to give an account and I can look you in the eye and tell you with a broken heart and in the grace and love and mercy of God, if you neglect this blessed Savior, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's the word of God. That's not your pastor. It's the word of God. I had the horror of knowing what you're going to go through. Paul said, knowing the tale of the Lord, we persuade men. The Bible says you're to meet often because in those last days men are going to forsake the gathering of themselves together. Have you become just a Sunday morning person? Now, evidently not because you're Sunday afternoon, but Beware. I don't ever want to have anything to do with a Sunday morning church. Never. Where are you on Tuesday nights? Where are you on Sunday nights? If you're parked in front of a television set, now, now listen to what he said. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And what he's saying, if you're going to be gathered together by the elect, with the elect, uh, when the angels come together from the four winds, you've got to get acquainted with those who are going. You've better stay together, and the whole Bible teaches that. Stay together where the flock is. I've got to move on. Number two, listen closely. You cannot be prepared until you settle every grudge, every single hurt, every seed of bitterness. And that was confirmed this morning so clearly here powerfully. I want you to go to James, please. The fifth chapter. Hebrews, and then turn right, and you're into James. For the new converts, please. For a lot of the older converts. Now, folks, listen to me, please. I told you that being prepared is no joking matter. I'm going to ask. I, I, I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm asking you to, to hear this pastor like you've never heard any preacher in your life now. 
because many of your souls depend on it right now. I'm about to wash my hands of any further obligation on behalf of some of you. And I want you to listen very, very closely. James 5, 8 and 9. Let's start with verse 7. Be ye patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband then waited for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. James is saying, look, Jesus is coming soon. Get your heart right. Better settle all your grudges soon, lest you be condemned, lest you be cast out of the bridehood. And the judge is standing at the door right now, waiting your decision, lest you be condemned. Now, folks, listen to me. This word grudge here is used in Greek. is taken from a root word that means narrow because of obstacles standing between. Now, here, here's the picture. Now, I want you to get this. Please, this, this is so important. It's a picture of one, of a person who's holding a grudge, a root of bitterness. He's allowed it to go so deep into the soul that the one who has grudged this person, or the one who uh, this person feels has done them wrong, there's no possibility that the person, should they be convicted, and God speaks to this person and says, you have done them wrong. You, you have caused this person hurt. This person under the anointing of the Holy Ghost goes to this individual and says, look, I've done you wrong. There's no possibility of getting near that heart because this person has put up obstacles and made the road to reconciliation so narrow it can't be passed. That's exactly what the Greek word means. Setting up a barrier obstacles, making the road so impassable, so narrow, that the one who wants to be reconciled, the one who would want to come and say, I'm sorry, and confess and bring healing, it's impossible because this person is holding a grudge. He's erected, see, he has erected these obstacles. And these obstacles, well, well now, I can't forgive you because I don't think you really feel sorry. Uh, I'll forgive you after I pray about it. I'll, I'll forgive you, perhaps, but you've got to let me know that you know what you did to me is so wrong. And we set up our own ways of reconciliation, not God's ways, our own parameters for reconciliation. Now I'm telling you, and hear it, we hear a lot of psychological jargon and garbage now. Blaming it on some past. No, no, no. God says, you have the obstacle. You erected it. Get it down quick before Jesus comes. God says, listen to me please, enough of your childish pride. Enough of holding on to your grudges. God is saying, if there are any obstacles between you and anyone that, that you are holding a grudge against, if you have any way hindered them from getting to you for reconciliation, you had better get down all the obstacles, remove them, remove them quickly, and make things right. You, 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 do you reject the word of God that says forbearing one another, forgiving one another? If any man have a crudge, a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. Jesus said, I forgave you. I forgave you. Now you forgive even as I forgive you. <clears throat> and then if you will not, let me show you. You know the consequences. We're going to go very quickly to Mark. 11th chapter, I could quote it to you, but I want you to see it again in black and white, or red. It's in red. Just go to Mark, please. 
11th chapter. This should be underlined in your Bible. 11th chapter, verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Everybody has a King James read aloud with me, verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Now you tell me, you tell me, look at me please, you tell me that you want to be ready when Jesus comes. Look at me now. You want to be gathered by the angels of God when he comes together, he's electing the four winds. I don't care what your theology is. I don't care how you excuse it. I don't care what kind of grace you'd like to cover over that. You can't. He said, if you're not forgiving, your sins are not forgiven. You're totally unforgiven. You're going to die in your sins. You want to die in your sins. Forget about being ready to go. You're going to die in your sins. If you will not forgive those who have hurt you, wounded you, grieved you, I don't care what they've done, he says, forgive. This is absolute proof that Christians who are unforgiving, who hold grudges, who stew in their bitterness can never, ever be saved. Now it gets even stronger. Go to Matthew 24, please. Twenty-fourth chapter of Matthew, please. Number three, no smiters. Are going. No smiters are going. Verse 48. Beginning to read Matthew 24. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord, the Lord is coming. Now, folks, I want you to notice this is a servant that has developed an evil heart. He says, My Lord. See, a type of a Christian, supposed to be a Christian. Because he says, my Lord, delayeth his coming to begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. He shall cut him asunder and appoint him with his portion. For the hypocrites there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, folks, look at me, please. To smite here means to inflict, listen closely, to inflict repeated blows. It's not just one slap on the face. Now, we're talking about using words. These are verbal hits, verbal slaps, Ver uh, someone with a stick verbally beating, tongue lashing. This is smiting. Folks, this, this, please, this is a householder. In other words, this has to be a husband or a wife, a pastor or a boss. It has to be somebody that has others under them. And, and there's, there's a, a drunken stupor that has gotten a hold of this individual. This individual has been hurt. This individual has a grudge. This individual has bitterness. And this individual gets on the telephone and eats and drinks with the drunken by eating the poison, drinking the poison, sharing it. That's eating and drinking with the drunken, intoxicated and sodded in mind and spirit by their bitterness. And it's gone so deep. It can be a husband who's bitter against the wife or a wife against the husband. She, he comes home from work. It starts in the morning. It starts all day long. The smiting, the lashing. It goes on and on and on. And the children are suffering. It, it's till late at night. And there are some of you sitting here right now, husbands and wives. You've been smiting one another. There's been something that he or she did 
You've not forgiven. You're still holding it. You've been smiting in constant inflicting blow after blow after blow. It could be a mother, a daughter, son, relative. It could be a boss who's hurt you. And if you're a leader, if you're a boss, there's anybody under you and there's somebody that you've taken a dislike to and you just keep applying the rod to them and you, verbally you lash them. This is the lashing. And then it's going out and talking about it. Going out and drinking it and eating it. A drunkenness and intoxication. A poison that's hardened. A poison that's set on punishing and punishing and punishing and never satisfied. I'm speaking to somebody now prophetically, either here in this building or on tape. And you will not forgive and you have determined that somebody's going to pay. They're going to be punished. And you won't stop. You're going on and on and on and you're beating it down and it's so gripped you. And let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible is so clear in Proverbs 13, 18. And here's what the Lord is saying. Look, you, you only do that because you don't believe the Lord is coming. He said, you, you have this concept that the Lord is the lady is coming. And you couldn't possibly be a smiter. You, you would have been convicted. You would have been afraid to go to sleep one night lest the Lord come and you'd be in that smiting spirit. You wouldn't do that. Other than if you believe that you're not going to be held accountable. But the Lord says, if you will not hear the eternal call, then let me tell you what's going to happen to you here on earth. Listen to Proverbs 13, 18. This is to the smiter. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth and receiveth reproof shall be honored. The Lord said, you hear my word and you repent and make it right. I will honor you. I'll give you all the grace and mercy. I'll send the Holy Ghost to empower you. I'll heal your family. I'll heal your finances. I'll heal everything about you. But if you go on your smiting way, he said, I promise you, you're going into poverty and you're going into shame. And I have seen this even the ministry. I've seen ministers who've held grudges against the congregation for being, uh, for putting them out or voting them out. Absolute bitterness. The wife wrote to us not too long ago. Her husband has gone out. He smokes, he drinks, he curses. He's mad at God now. He smites everybody and everything in sight. He's lost his job. They've lost everything. And a family's taken in the wife and kids. And I tell you, I tell you, Smiter, unless you get rid of it, you are headed for poverty. You'll lose your husband, your wife will lose your job, you'll lose your furniture, you'll lose your car, you'll lose everything. The Bible says you go to poverty, you go to shame. He said you won't be induced by the warning of my coming, you, you won't, you believe that I've delayed my coming, all right, let me tell you. Poverty and shame. Folks, it's time to take the word of God seriously. God means what he says. He's a God of love. He's a God of mercy. But he also says, I'm a consuming God. I will consume that which mocks my grace, that which frustrates and despises my grace. Folks, there's not a church in America that's had as much or more grace than has been preached from this pulpit. We will preach grace. We will preach mercy. But folks, I want you to know something. God says the day of grace is about to end. The day of grace is coming to an end. Time shall be no more. And while there's grace, while there's time, Jesus waits for you with love. He weeps over you. He's ready to rush in right now with every bit of strength that you need. And all you have to say is, oh, God, I don't want this burden anymore. It's destroying my soul. It's eating my life. It's, it's made me a mean-faced, 
creature that hates to wake up in the morning. There's a mean streak in me. There's something in me I despise. Oh, God. Folks, turn to the Lord with all your heart. Folks, if, 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 if anybody, if you know of anybody, you pray and seek the Lord. I told you how he, he, he named people, over 15 or some, that I had to make things right. And I did, and I thank God for it. And if God shows me tonight before I go to bed anyone, I'll get on the phone if I have to wake him up in the middle of the night. If, I'll write a letter. I'll do anything because I am not going to be left behind. I am going to be prepared. Hallelujah. I'm going to be prepared for his coming. <sighs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is not a message to make you shout. But it will save your soul. I want everybody within the sound of my voice to examine your heart right now before the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Number one, is Christ your life more than sports? I'm not saying sports in itself is evil. I'm saying if it's consuming you, it can keep you out of heaven. Are, are, are you uh, feasting your eyes on Phil when he wants to cleanse your eyes? He's come for those with a pure heart. <clears throat> Are you involved in adultery, or fornication, and God's been dealing with you for a long time, and you've heard of his mercy and grace, you have just used that, and you say, well, thank God he loves me, and, and one of these days I will, no, now, now, do it now, make it right. That's what his mercy is all about, that the, that the grace of God would lead you to repentance. To all godliness, that the grace of God would lead you to all godliness and holiness. Have you neglected His Word? Do you neglect Him day after day and you don't seek His face? Then what you do now is repent. You repent before the Holy Ghost, you repent before the Lamb of God. Say, Lord, that's me. I'm not going to put it aside, I'm not going to cast it aside. I receive it from my pastor. Lord, I failed you. I've not been awake. I've been slothful. I've been lazy about your things. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. If you're here up in the balcony on the main floor, and you know as you're sitting here right now, Brother Dave, I am not right with God. I, I have just flaunted the grace of God. I have not been walking with the Lord at all. But I want, I want him, I need him. I want to get rid of this burden. I want you to get up, up, up out of your seat. Folks, just stay seated, but I want you to just get up out of your seat. And, and the people will let you out of the aisle. We usually have everybody stand so you can get out, but up in the balcony, up in the main floor here. But we better stand, folks. We better stand because it's almost impossible to get out of those seats. Now listen to me, please. A message like this brings heaviness until the Holy Ghost has completed his work. And then the joy of the Lord breaks out spontaneously because we have obeyed his holy word. Hallelujah. Up in the balcony main floor, if the Holy Ghost has convicted you by this message, if you have been convicted by the word of the Lord, I want you to get out of your seat. And come and make it right with the Lord right now. Lord Jesus, I've been slothful. I've been lazy about you, the things of God. And I want you, Lord Jesus, to awaken my spirit and my soul. I repent before you, Lord. I come to your grace. Oh, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive you immediately. He'll forgive you instantly. Move in close, please. And as soon as you come, Turn to the Lord with your heart. You just turn to him right now, and in your own words, tell him, tell him exactly what's in your heart. Tell him exactly what's in your heart. Let the Holy Spirit put his searchlight into your heart right now. Let the searchlight be turned right on to your heart right now. We pastors stand before God and give an account. We know everyone has to give their own account. I have to give an account for, for 
for being a shepherd who obeys his voice and preaches his truth. I'm responsible for preaching truth, come what may. Now, now my, my natural inclination is to just say, say a quick prayer and everybody get happy and let's clap our hands and have a good time. But here's what the Holy Ghost is saying to me, and I want you to listen closely. The Holy Ghost has said very clearly in my heart that he has, he's already told you a few times in the past already about some things you need to make right. You were going to do it, but you didn't do it. You justified it. You justified it. And the Lord said, no. Now, now, I want everybody in this house to hear me. Everybody. And this includes me. This is not a joke. This is your eternal salvation. Don't come to me with some doctrinal excuse. Yes, we're secure in the Lord. But he said, if you absolutely disobey brazenly my word, you're despising my grace. Yes, he'll forgive you. He'll forgive you instantly. He's ready to forgive. He's ready to heal. But he's waiting for you. He will not do what you have to do. He'll not do that which is your part, mine. I'm asking you now. You make up your mind. You're in the presence of God today. You don't have to go searching down the crossroads or inroads of your mind. The Holy Ghost will put it right in front of you. The name, the person. Now, if you've already done that, this message should only encourage you. If you've already made your wrongs right, this should only bless you. But the Holy Ghost is so faithful, is so faithful that he will bring to your attention. He'll not play games with you. He'll tell you outright. Make it right. He'll name the people. You have a grudge? I don't care if it's 30 years old. Make it right. I don't care if the person you go to turns you down and mocks you and says you're crazy. You've done your part. Move on. You just pray for them. Doesn't mean you have to walk in their shoes. Doesn't mean that you have to walk around embracing them forever saying I'm sorry. You see it and mean it and pray for them and go your way. But there's some of you in this church. You need to get some others in this church because you've been smiting some. You just keep going and going and going and going and you won't give up. You hold it and hold it. Some of you have been in this church five or six years and you're still holding it on somebody. Don't tell me you're going to heaven. Don't tell me you will be saved. No way. Everything you do, is just, it, it, the Bible says it's, it's not going to work. And, and some of you are having a, a mess in your life because you're just not getting it. You're not understanding it, how simple this is. The Lord says, if, if you will take this reproof, I'll honor you. I will honor you. I will bless you. That's promise. Hallelujah. Lord, I, I can't do this. I am totally inadequate. Lord, I know you put this on my heart. I know you're coming soon. I know, Lord, when I woke up, you told me, be ye ready is no joking matter. There's no joke time to get serious about the things of God, about this book, about walking in faith, about not, about being too busy and neglecting him. Lord, we're not to just give you words, we're to give you all of our heart. I want everybody that came forward, everybody in the house loves Jesus, raise your hands, and I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, forgive me for my slothfulness. Awaken me. Forgive me, Jesus. I've neglected you. Now help me by your Holy Spirit to have removed from me every grudge, every hurt feeling, all root of bitterness. Lord, I want to be free 
forgive me, cleanse me, send your Holy Ghost, and help me now to obey you. I love you, Jesus. Now I want you to raise your hand, just love him, just worship him now, and tell him, Lord, tell the Lord right now, I'm sorry, Lord, I've neglected you, I give you my heart, I give you my time, draw me back, Lord, to your first love. Draw me back that I may go out seeking after you with all my heart. You're coming for those who seek you with all the heart, all the soul, all the mind, and all the strength. Lord, you're not coming for a church but to sleep, so wake us up. Heavenly Father, what exciting times to be alive. To, to be living at that time just before Christ returns. To live at that time when all the ends of the world are coming up, apart. And to know that no matter what happens, we are His. We are saved. And we are His holy people. Lord, I pray tonight that the message will change lives. God, don't let anybody in the building tonight sit here without knowing, feeling, sensing the Holy Spirit's presence. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and speak through the power of your word. Let the word go forth as a two-edged sword to cut through everything in our hearts to the very marrow of our bone. Lord, cut us to heal us. Lord, there are people here tonight that are sick of their sin. They're tired of being a slave to the devil. They're tired of being pushed around by their sins and the devil. God, open up a door of escape. Let there be a miracle happen to everybody here tonight that's tired of sin. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Be ye holy. Three months after Israel left Egypt, they arrived at the foot of Mount Sinai. This great mountain, Moses looked at it and climbed up that mountain to talk to God. And here's what God said to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. I'm going to come to you in the form of a dark cloud so that the people themselves can hear me when I talk with you. And then they will always believe you. So go down and get the people ready for my visit. Sanctify them. Have them wash their clothes. Let them, abs let them abstain from sexual contact with their wives. Set boundary lines around the mountain so the people can't pass by and warn them not to come near the mountain. Tell them not to even touch the boundary lines or they will die. And when you hear the sound of a ram's horn sounding one long blast, then gather all the children of Israel at the foot of the mountain outside the boundaries. And on the morning of the third day, there was an awesome thunder and lightning storm and a huge cloud came down upon the mountain and all Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because Jehovah God descended upon it in the form of fire. The whole mountain shook with a violent earthquake. As the trumpet blast grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God thundered his answer. God thundered his answer. What did God thunder? What did he say to Moses and all of his people? He said this, You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. You shall be a holy people. You shall be... God thundered that from heaven. Wouldn't you think that people who saw a mountain shake for six days, God rumbled that mountain. In fact, it was so horrifying, so frightening, they moved way back away from these boundaries around the mountain. Many of them hid in their tents. You could hear God speaking, but it was like thunder. There was lightning. Six days, lightning and thunder and earthquakes because God was speaking to Moses. Wouldn't you think that people who saw the very presence of God, who heard Him speak with thunder, wouldn't you think that they'd never turn their back on God again? Wouldn't you think, well, that was so powerful, that'll change their life forever? 
But you know, in just 40 days, those people turned their back on God, became corrupted, stripped off their clothes and danced around a golden calf. Now, there's a prophecy in Hebrews. See, that's the Old Testament. Let me take you into the New Testament. It has to do with you and me. There's a beautiful but very important prophecy. And here it is. His voice once shook the earth, but now God has promised, saying, once more I'm going to shake not only the earth, but heaven also. So see that you don't refuse me when I speak. For if Israel didn't escape when they refused when I spoke on earth, much more shall you not escape if you turn away from God that speaketh from heaven. God says once more, I'm going to shake the whole world like I did at Mount Sinai. And not only the earth, I'm going to shake the heaven. All the angels, Michael, the archangel, and all the seraphims, and all the uh, elders, and all those who are gathered around the throne of God, the prince of powers and powers of heaven, and all the kingdom of the devil, Satan's kingdom is going to be shaken, and all earthly kingdoms are going to be shaken because God is going to thunder from heaven again. I call my people to be holy. I am calling for holiness. We're beginning to see the fulfillment of that prophecy right now. My friends, God is going to shake everything that can be shaken. And the only thing that's going to remain when Jesus comes are things that can't be shaken, that are on the rock. Jesus Christ, unmovable. People who are closing in their hearts close to Christ, being filled with His Holy Spirit, and changed by His power. Be ye holy. God said, 1 Peter 1, 16, Be ye holy even as I am holy. God said, Be ye holy even as I am holy. This message has to be heard by every Christian. That's a message for Mohammedans, Gentiles, Jews, Catholics, Protestants, every race and color and creed. God demands holiness. I hear that cry of the Holy Ghost in me. I've had it now on me for four to five months. I've been shutting myself in with God and I hear that night and day. God is gathering together a holy, sanctified people. Jesus came along and He said, you're not only to be holy, you're going to be perfect. Be ye perfect, even as your Heavenly Father is perfect. And then you go to the New Testament and you listen to all these, it seems like impossible demands. God said He's coming back for people that are holy and blameless, glorious, without spot or wrinkle. That means not even a spot of sin in their life. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable, righteous, pure, clean, cleansed from all the filthiness of the flesh. Now, the Scripture says there is not one person righteous, not one. There's none that understand it. There's none that seeketh after God. Everyone's turned away from Him and become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. That means in their own strength and their own power. This was before Jesus Christ came to reveal His righteousness. There was no righteous person on the face of the earth. But can you name me one truly holy, perfect person on the face of the earth? You may know somebody that's religious, that goes to church a lot and testifies a lot. But you really don't know somebody that is really perfect like God. Now, I want to show you something tonight. God demands perfect holiness. He demands perfection. He demands that there be something happen in you that presents you to Him as a holy, perfect person. And when you hear that demand, you have to answer it in one of three ways. And everybody listening to, not, to me tonight is answering that call to be holy in one of these three ways. And I'm going to show you these three ways. And I want you to find out, examine yourself and see which way you're responding to this call to be holy. 
the first response is to just give up and quit trying because you know you can't do it. All multitudes around the world are giving up. They say, I can't be holy. That's too high of a demand. I can never reach it. You see, inside your heart, there's a conscience. And it's that conscience that says, do right. Be holy. God pre-programmed that before you were even born. And if your conscience isn't saying, be holy, be clean, then you've seared it with a hard iron. You've messed it up. Your conscience should be saying, God wants you to do right. God wants you to be holy. Every sinner at one time or another remembers that God brought his fear upon them, just as he did to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. Every sinner in this place tonight listening to me remembers a time that you were afraid of God. You had a real fear in your heart. There was a time you really tried. You said, I'm going to do right. I'm going to be holy. I'm going to be clean. I'm going to be pure. And you tried and you tried and the harder you tried, the worse it got. Every promise you made, you broke. I mean, you did everything within your power trying to be holy and clean. I, I have preached in some of the worst places for sinners in the world. I held a crusade in Mexico City, the, huge, the, the largest prison in the world. I was told over 5,000 prisoners and my crusade was held inside this big prison in the security ward, a security ward with inside the prison. Nobody got out of this ward. There were 150 to 200 men in there. Every one of them were there for life, for murder or rape. Some of them had murdered and raped. I was in this security ward. And I, I looked at those murders and rapists. And you know what I did? I thought there was a time that those, and oh, they were hard. They were killers. I said, God, how'd they get that way? How did they get so hard? There was a time they were tender children. They, they, they honored you. They, they were reaching out to you, God. But what happened to them? I see drug addicts and alcoholics and prostitutes walking the street and just throwing their life away and say, God, what happened? At one time, their mother and dad had them on the lap. They were dear children. They played ball with their friends and, and many of them went to Sunday school and church. And what happened to them? How'd they get so hard? And, and you see, this is what happens to the children of Israel. If you go back to this mountain here, let me tell you why people get hard. Let me tell you why people turn against God. They get just a little mad at him. They get angry at him. Now go back to Mount Sinai. Sinai, and, and look for six days, God speaking and thundering. The Bible said, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of all the children of Israel. For 40 days, 40 nights, Moses was up there communing with God. But, you know, for six days, that mountain was rumbling. And you see all the people sitting in their tents. And Moses is gone. And now the mountain's quieted down. The thunder and the lightning is gone. And you can hear the people talking in their tents. And one man is saying to the other, he, he says, how? how? How can we be holy? See, God had already given them the law. Thou shalt not... Commit adultery. Thou shalt have no other God. Thou shalt not steal. And they started playing over those laws in their mind. And they saw the terrible fear of God. And they were saying, how can I be holy like that? How can I be like that? I can't be like that. And, and they saw how sinful and how weak they could feel the flesh in them. Their evil desires. And then they looked at the law of God, said, that's impossible. And I can see them going from tent to tent. And pretty soon there are little groups here, a little group here. And they're, they're all, they're beginning. It's probably 10 days now gone by. And people are saying, hey, I don't understand that. How can you be holy? How can you be clean? I don't. And one man finally stands up and says, well, I don't know about the rest of you. And I can just imagine in my mind this happening. I don't know about the rest of you, but I can't serve a God who scares you. 
I can't serve a God that's that's mean and angry. See, they picture God as mean and angry. Just sticking the law out there, bringing them out in the wilderness and abandoning them. Allow them to be tempted and then saying, you're going to be tempted, but don't give in to it. You're going to have sin all around you, but I expect you to stay clean. Don't touch the sin. And that's what's happened. You know, here's what happens in Israel now. You say, Brother David, how can people who had seen the glory of God in just 40 days turn their back on God? Do you know that Aaron, his high priest, had been up on that mountain with Moses, along with Nadab and Abihu, two other priests? And the Bible says, listen to this. Aaron also saw the God of Israel walking on a brilliant pavement of sapphire stones. Now, no one has seen the face of God. Even though God spoke face to face with Moses, he spoke through a veil and and then only in shadows. But you see, God revealed his back parts and revealed his feet walking on sapphire stones. And Aaron had been on that mountain. He actually saw the feet of God walking on this jeweled pavement. This was a vision, this eternal cosmic path. God was walking it. You know what he did? This man who'd been in the very presence of God. Folks, what would you do if you had been up on a mountain and you actually saw God walking? You saw Almighty God, the God of the whole universe walking. And you knew you were in His presence. You heard this earth-shattering thunder of His voice. What you say? Oh, I'm going to serve a God like that. He has so much power. It was, it was something else. But look, 40 days later, that same man, those people of Israel now saying, we can't serve that kind of God. They got mad at God for making such a big demand to be holy. And they didn't know how to be holy to put such a law on them. And they didn't know how to fulfill the law. And so they came to Aaron. They said, we don't know what happened to that man, Moses, and his God. We want another God. So Aaron says, bring all your earrings, bring all your gold. And he put them in a fire. And the Bible said he fashioned, in other words, he molded a golden calf out of all the gold earrings and all the gold bracelets and and, uh, medallions. And not only did he build a golden false altar, uh, uh, a golden calf, he built an altar in front of that golden calf. Can you imagine a man of God who'd been on a mountain seeing God walk in just 40 days saying to all Israel, come gather around. This is your God. He's pointing to a piece of gold. He said, this is the God that brought you out of Israel. This is, this is your God. The people started stripping off their clothes, getting drunk, cutting themselves, singing and dancing, lewd and nude. I mean, in 40 days, that nation went crazy. Three million Jews dancing. Now, I'm sure not all of them, because later God found some people that want Moses found some people that are on God's side. I, I believe there were multitudes that didn't give in to that. But all oh, there was a spirit, a wild spirit group gripped Israel that day. And I've thought about that. Oh, I've, I've thought about that for days now. How can people turn their back on God 40 days from heaven to hell? And I think I know God's given me the clue. I know now why sinners rebel against Jesus Christ. I know those who once known the Lord. They've been to church. They've known God's power. They've known His glory. And then they turn against God. They serve the devil with all their heart. I've seen people so on fire for God. And a week later, right down on their back, serving the devil. You wouldn't even know they ever knew God. Just like Aaron and the children of Israel. And I know why that man. Can't you see Aaron getting mad? He said, oh man, I I can't. God's too high. He's too holy. I'm too weak. I'll never make it. And I think in Aaron's heart there was an anger. He was mad that God made such a great holy demand. 
He said, be holy, even as I am holy. And Aaron says, I can't be holy like you, holy God. And so he had to come down here. And this, that, that whole wild scene was an act of rebellion. It was a madness. People saying, I can't be holy. I can't do it. I've tried it. I can't make it. So they just went wild. Mo God was angry. He said to Moses, get down off this mountain. Go back to your people. Look how quickly they've turned away from me and my commandment to be holy. Folks, there's never been anything like it in the history of the world. When God's chosen people in just 40 days went from the glory and the voice of God to worshiping a golden calf. You see, there are some of you here right now. You said, I can't serve a God like you serve, Brother David. I can't serve that kind of God. I tried and I can't make it. I can't be holy. And you're mad at God. Aaron was mad at God. The children of Israel were mad at God. He said, isn't it bad enough to be in a world like this where there's so much temptation and trial? Then God... Come along and tell you you're going to be damned if you don't live up to his holy standards. He said, I can't do it. You see, that that's, that's what's happening to many of you sitting here tonight. That's the way you've responded. You said, I can't be holy. So you just gave up. You gave up. And there are dozens and dozens of people sitting here tonight. You may not admit it, but down deep in your heart, you're just a little mad at God. You're a little mad that he just didn't come down and take all the sin out of your heart and do it for you. You're kind of mad that God, you, you feel your conscience screaming at you. And you say, God, I wish you'd leave me alone. I've had drug addicts walk out on me. And I'd see them three or four weeks later on the street. And they'd say, David, get off my back. I said, well, I'm not on your back. One drug addict said, well, somebody on my back. Every time I stick a needle in, I hear God breathing down my neck. And he said, I hear you praying for me. Quit praying for me. Folks, the most miserable sinners in the world are those who've once seen the glory and the power of God. And then they go out and try to serve the devil. Oh, how miserable, how terrible it is. They're miserable. The most miserable sinners in the world. Better than ever come to Jesus and having come to Jesus, go out and try to live for the devil. You're messed up. You don't have a chance. Miserable. The second response, God says, be holy. So bless God, I'm going to be holy if it kills me. And so you start out in your own effort to be righteous and holy and clean and pure. You say, well, bless God, I'm going to suppress the devil in me. I'm going to burn it out. I'm going to pray it out. I'm going to fast it out. Somehow I'm going to please God. I'm not going to hell, man. I'm going to be holy. Sounds like somebody knows what I'm talking about tonight. Paul said of these people, I give them credit for having a zeal or love for God, but it's all misdirected because they are ignorant of God's holiness and righteousness. So they go about to establish their own righteousness. They say, I'm going to do it myself. They have not submitted. They've not surrendered themselves to the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. They are going about to try to be holy in their own way. You see, they, they go into the Bible and they say, well, there it is. God told you. God says, shun the very parents of evil. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The Bible says, put aside the sin that easily besets you. The Bible says, put off the old man and the old evil desires. Touch not the unclean thing. The Bible says, don't yield your body to the devil and to temptation. That makes it sound like it, it's something just you do, doesn't it? So people say, well, that's what it says. Go do it. So I've got to go do it. Well, you go do it in your own power and you'll fail. You'll fall fat in your face. You'll make promise after promise. You'll break every promise you make. And the harder you try, the worse it'll get. You cannot do it on your own strength. So off we go. So, well, I'm going to be holy, so we're, we're going to give up cigarettes. And we give up drinking. Some give up drugs. 
Some quit going to theaters. And some quit dancing and some quit playing their cards. Now, folks, a true Christian doesn't have anything to do with any of that. He leaves that all behind because he doesn't need that because he's satisfied with Jesus, you see. But you see, doing all those things, you can quit all those things and still be full of the devil and never be saved. Even if you leave all those things. I know a lot of self-righteous Christians. They go around boasting, I don't smoke, I don't drink. They're like the publican in the Bible, or, or you know, the Pharisee in the Bible. They go around saying, I don't live like those poor sinners. And they stick their nose up. They go to church. They're so self-righteous that everybody thinks they're holy. And the Lord Jesus looked at those self-righteous Pharisees. He said, on the outside, you look like you're white and clean and all washed up. But inside, you're full of dead man's bones. You're full of stinking putrefaction. You're full of worms and snakes. He called them vipers. Snakes. Some of you people that are sinners say, boy, that makes me feel pretty good. Well, follow me, please. There are others who want to be holy so badly they fast and they pray and they weep. You see, they, they sin and confess and sin and confess. It's a merry-go-round. They never see they get out of Egypt, but they never go to Canaan land. They live in the wilderness. God didn't call you just out of Egypt, which is the world, to stick you in a wilderness of depression and fear and being a victim of the devil. No, you're just passing through. God wants you someday to get to Canaan where there's victory over the power of the devil. Oh, think of all the, in New York City. I've watched it for years. Sweet little Catholic grandmothers. They never miss mass every day of the year through the sleet and the snow. It can be 15 below zero and chill factor. And there's a little grandma's all wrapped up and they're going to mass and they've got their, their little rosaries and, and they're praying. They, she prays to Mary. She prays to all the saints. Oh, Mary and, and all the saints, Joseph and, and every saint, please make me acceptable to God. Please make me holy. Now, folks, that's beautiful. That's commendable. But see, the Lord said that's a zeal. It's misdirected. And she said, unless that dear mother submits to the righteousness and believes that Jesus Christ alone can make her holy, she could never be holy if she went to mass for 50 years. Think of all the Jewish, very orthodox, religious Jewish people all over the world who, who want to be holy like their father Abraham. And so they they go through all the traditions. Oh, they are so strict. Very, very strict. They never miss it. They they keep the law. They keep it right down to the minutest detail. But the Bible now that's commendable and thank God for devout Jewish friends. But the Bible said unless you submit to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. All of your works, all of your self-righteousness is filthy rags in His sight. All your tradition, all of your self-efforts mean nothing in the sight of God. The prophet Ezekiel said, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him on the day of his sin if he trusts in his own righteousness, if he trusts in his own self-effort. Do you know God hates God despises every effort to please Him through self-effort, through just doing it by yourself. Every book that's been written about how to be holy, every holiness movement that, that tries to say you're going to be holy by doing this or doing that, that's all in vain. Now, give me your good ear right now. I want to show you something. I'm a student of church history. Let me show you what I found. These are monks. These are men who wanted to be holy so bad, they thought they'd try to destroy their flesh. They had evil desires in them. Their mind was evil. Their eye was full of lust. And it scared them. And they heard God say, be holy. And listen to what they did. Some monks slept on bundles of thorns and piles of broken glass. They made their beds out of thorns and broken glass and slept for years on thorns and broken glass, thinking if they'd suffer through their body, 
and feel the pain that would push all the evil out of them. Some of the monks bound one foot and tied the foot this way and for years hopped around on one foot by thinking, well, God, look how desperate I am. I'm desperate enough to hop around on one foot to be holy. And some of them finally were crippled. A monk by the name of Simon, Simon Stylites had a big column, a big stone column, 30 feet high. He climbed up that column. They had a little rope they had to bring his food. And he stayed on top of that column for 30 years so that would take him away from all the temptations of the world. And when he didn't have any more strength, he had somebody erect a pole on top there and he strapped himself with ropes. And he finally died up there. He was up there, I think, some 42 years up there trying to be holy, trying to stay away from the world. 42 years up on top of that column. Folks, you, you say that's foolish, that's stupid. But look in our modern days. I'll tell you what I've been through. Even I'm only 50 years old. When I was a kid, you know, to be holy, your hair had to be a certain way. Now, when, when there was a time that short hair was a sin and then long hair was a sin. And I, 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 when, when I was a young man in church, makeup was a sin. My granddad called women who used rouge and makeup prostitutes right from the pulpit. He said, you're a harlot. I mean, only harlots did that. And, and I, I went into a church once when I was a boy. And the preacher, this is the truth, he had a, a, a yardstick tacked to the door. And he stamped the door of the church. And the women had to have their dresses at a certain length. And he had another yardstick. And if he thought the, the he, he measured the length, a short dress was of the devil. And you dare not wear a real short, you know, the kind that you see around today. Your dress had to be long. Your, your sleeves had to be long. And man, you weren't a Christian unless you wore the right kind of clothes. And usually it had to be black. One of the great holiness preachers of all time, Dr. Pink. I've got all of I've got almost all of his books. And and he wanted he preached nothing but holiness, you see. And he said, I don't even cook. It's a sin to cook on Sunday. He said, We cook all our meals on Saturday, and we serve it cold on Sunday. Now he was an Englishman. He said, Except for tea, we do cook our tea. You see what you get into? All the rules and regulations. And people are going around and they think that just because... You, they, almost everybody knows, well, I've got this one thing in my life. If I can just get the victory of this one thing, I'd be a holy person. No, you wouldn't. Something else would come in and suck up into that place. It'd be something else. God won't let you pick and choose. He won't let you fight just one sin in your life. That's not the way it works. We've invented all these modern ways to try to be holy. You know, there are some church groups and little prayer groups that think that they're suddenly become very holy people. They're, they're, they're kind of self-righteous. See, they've discovered what they call holiness. And, and they said, we have left the world completely. Some of them go to communes to live. And, and that's why there are so many Christian communes now, because people want to be holy. But folks are going about it in the wrong way. You can't be holy by just taking yourself away. The monasteries proved that. For years, men tried to be holy by shutting them into monasteries. And it never did work. Some of the worst temptations men ever fought were inside the cloistered walls of monasteries. Some of the worst temptations that people have ever gone through have gone through in Christian communes where the world was shut out. Because you see, you don't shut the world out just by your location. Here's where you shut the world out in your heart. And I believe Jesus Christ can give you a holiness so powerful, so much like himself, that you could walk through hell itself. And if every demon and devil of hell was spit out on earth, it wouldn't touch you because you have an inner holiness that will take you through any hell. Hallelujah. Oh, my heart breaks. You know, I look at the church. And I see such worldly mindedness and I see people so materialistic minded. I've had young couples confess when they come forward, Brother Dave, you're preaching 
convicted me tonight because I, I was out for bigger house and bigger cars and I wanted all these things and I was never satisfied. And I see this lusting and grabbing and reaching for material things. People want it so bad. And I see people that don't pray anymore. And, and I see people parked in front of their TV sets watching junk. Folks, you know that within two or three years, we're going to have nudity on the soap operas. They already have it in Australia, New Zealand. And it's coming to America. I saw it in Newsweek magazine. And if you read my book, The Vision, six years ago, I predicted that was coming. And old friends, we're right at the brink of it now. And all hell is going to break loose in America and the world. And I see the worldliness in the church. And, and I know that in spite of all that, that people are wanting to be hungry. And they, they really want to do what is right. And I want to stand up and scream, be holy. And I hear that cry of God to this wicked generation with the world creeping into the church. We've got to be holy. We've got to be pure. And then I look at people trying. Oh, how we try. Folks, I spent years crying, fasting, praying, weeping. Oh, God, make me holy. But I would always feel that God was mad at me. I always felt, I, I, I would, you see, if you try yourself, you, you can make it for a week, sometimes a month, or maybe even a year, but then just when you think you got a lick, bang, down you go. Hmm? Uh-huh. Everybody that knows that's true, say amen. Oh, yes, you testify how God saved you and filled you with the Spirit, and then all of a sudden, you look at yourself, and when you're honest, you know that you're not what you should be. The evil thoughts, and I mean, you could be a very saintly person and have all the darkness of hell flood your mind, fill you with lust, and set your eyes aflame, and then you, the devil comes along and says, you're dirty, you're filthy. And a lot of Christians do that, and they just give up. They say, I can't make it. They quit. Let me bring you to the beautiful part. The third response, the kind the Holy Ghost wants from you and me now. When God demands you to be holy, admit you can't be holy on your own power. So surrender to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Give up fighting the battle yourself and surrender by faith to his promise to make you holy. God has promised to make you holy. You see, God made that demand so high, so impossible, you can't do it. You tell me one person in this building that can meet that demand to be holy. Show me one person that can meet that demand to be holy on their own strength and on their own power. Why did God make it so powerful? You know why God did that to children? You know why he appeared in his glory and gave the law? He was trying to show those people that they couldn't do it. And he had a tabernacle built for them. And inside that tabernacle, a priest was consecrated. And there was an altar there. And he said, "You, I've made it so high, you can't do it. And you're going to fail. But he said, once a year, there's going to be Aaron or Moses is going to have a, a little lamb. And that lamb is called the atonement. And I'm going to have that lamb slain and the blood's going to be applied. He said, I want every one of you to know that that lamb there is going to make it possible you to be relieved from all the guilt. And when that lamb is slain, I'm going to forgive all your sins, even sins you don't know about. Everything you've committed, you may have broken the law and didn't know it. And if you, if you didn't have this lamb, you could be slain, you could be killed because you broke the law. And all God wanted to do was to make them know how helpless they were to show them how impossible to keep the law so that when that lamb was slain they could see a picture of something going to try to show the whole world because that lamb was this symbol of Jesus Christ who was slain on a cross and he made atonement so that the world could be forgiven of all their sins and could be made holy and righteous by what Jesus did that lamb laying on that altar wiped away their sins and their guilt. He made a way for them to be holy and to be clean in his sight by putting their faith 
in what was done on that altar. You and I are supposed to look to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on a cross and he shed his blood so that you didn't have to be a slave of the devil anymore. So that he could kill the power of the devil and his sin in you. God never intended for you to do anything more but to look at his law, to be holy and fall on your face and say, God, I can't be holy. I've tried and I've tried. Folks, I got tired of trying to be holy. I got tired of making him promises. And I said, I said, God, when you sent Jesus to die at the cross, is that all that I got out of it? Is that all of it? Is that all it means that that I come in, I get saved, and then I'm tossed around by the devil, tossed around by temptations and trials like a victim? God, didn't you say that you came to destroy the power of the devil? Didn't you say you put your neck on the devil and destroyed his power and took it all away from him? For the believer, those who trust you. And folks, my heart began to hunger for his holiness and his righteousness that comes by faith. The Bible said you must submit to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so one day in my desperation... I came into the presence of Jesus. I knelt down and humbled myself. And I said, oh God, I'm nothing but a piece of dirt. See, that's what God wants out of you. He wants you to see how hopeless it is. He wants, you to, show, he wants to show you how weak, how sinful you and I are. And then when you feel low, when you feel helpless, then he says, all right, now that you're down in the dirt, now that you feel low, now that you know you can't do it by yourself, now that you've quit trying to do it by yourself, Come on into my presence now. Come to me and confess your weakness. He said, deny yourself and take up your cross. That's not self-denial. That means deny that you have any power to do it yourself. Deny your self-effort. Say no to trying to do it by your own strength. And you go into the presence of Jesus and you say, Savior, you died on the cross to break the power of sin and I can't break it. So I come confessing my sin to you and I give you my life that Jesus said, come to me and present your body to me, a living sacrifice. You know what that means? That means you don't just come to the altar. You get on the altar. Uh, thousands and thousands of Christians have been to the altar, but they've not been on it. He said a living sacrifice. That means he wants to kill you. He wants to kill the sin nature in you. He wants to kill the power of sin in you. And the only way that will happen is to come like a lamb and submit and lay on that altar. And look up to him and say, God, I'm scared. But I know I can't go on the way I am. Take the knife of your holy word and your promises. Slay me. Kill the old man in me. You see, there's an old sin nature in you. You got it from Adam. You got it when you were born. If you don't believe that, you watch little kids play, just three and four years old. You watch them fight and scrap. You watch how jealous they are. They won't share their toys. Don't tell me they're not a sin nature in us. It's there. You can see it in your little children. But God wants to kill that old man in you. He wants to have you laid on that altar. He said, come, present your body to me. Lay down on my altar. And he said, I'm going to take that old man out of you. I'm going to kill him. And he said, there's going to be some blood flow. You see, it's his blood that cleanses. But he also has to suck, not only kill the old man, but suck the very blood out of him and leaving nothing left. And then you see, he burns all the fat. On that sacrifice, that means all the sin and all the corruption, everything is burned. He's a consuming fire. He comes down and you sense God moving in your heart. There's a fire burning in your side. You say, I hate my sin. I'm going to rise out of this. And I'm going to be a new man, a new woman. If any man is in Christ, he's a new person. All the old things pass away. All things become new. And if they passed away, they can't hound you anymore. If they passed away, they're dead. They're dead. And by faith, you are raised up a new person in the spirit. You go down on that altar, a physical person, a sinful person. 
And God, by faith, can't you just see in your mind like a spirit rising off that altar? It's the soul rises up. That old dead flesh is laying there and the spirit rises. It's going to happen when you die. That soul, that spirit of you is going to rise right out of that body. And when you come to Jesus, you say, Lord, I'm going to stay here. I want you to kill all the sin in me. And I want a new spiritual man, a woman to rise out of that. And that is the only way to be holy. And folks, it's going to get so bad in these next few years. The Bible says, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. The devil's going to be cast down on you. And he's mad because he knows his time is short. Folks, we're going to have X-rated movies on cable already. And soon they're going to be 70, 80 stations you're going to be able to turn to on your TV set. Probably 10 to 12 of them are going to be R and X-rated. We are going to see rebellion and violence and hatred and all sin. We're going to see ungodly people stand up and mock everything that's holy and sacred. And how are you going to stand in those trying times? How are you going to stand up and be clean and holy when all hell is broken loose? There is only one way, folks, and that's to surrender and say, I can't fight the spirit of this age, but I come to you, Jesus Christ, and I want you to kill that old love for the world. Take the spirit of the world out of me. Kill the old nature. Kill the old man in me. Make me a new person in Christ Jesus. And the one who brings you to the altar, the one who lays you down, the one who kills the old man, the one who convicts you of your sin, is the one who has the power to keep you from your sins. He's got the power to save you and keep you. I'm going to give you a prophecy before I close. There's going to be a revival of holiness. It's already started. Folks, I'm getting letters from pastors and churches across the country. People are fasting and praying again. People have tried materialism. It doesn't work. It makes them feel empty inside. It doesn't satisfy. Sin doesn't satisfy. People are getting sick and tired of the sin. Oh, it... It feels okay for a while, but then it leaves you dry and empty and dead inside. People are tired of that. And I want you to know that just before Jesus comes, he's going to bring a spirit of righteousness and holiness. He's going to bring many, many people into his kingdom. He's going to put robes of righteousness on them. He's going to give them power over the devil. Saints, God's going to show his church the power they have. We haven't been exercising his power. We have all power over all the power of the devil. And you don't have to be afraid anymore. Oh, church of Jesus Christ, Christian, rise up by faith and put your foot on the devil's neck and say, I'm victorious in Jesus Christ. Victory in Jesus. Listen to John's revelation. And this is in eternity, before the throne of God. Listen to this. And I saw a great multitude, which no man could number, from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. And they were standing before his throne and before the Lamb, and they were all clothed in white robes, and they had palms in their hand. And they were crying with a loud voice, Salvation is to our God. The lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and he shall lead them to living fountains of waters. God will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Multitudes which no man could number. Think of that. The devil thinks that because he's come down, he's defeated the church of Jesus Christ. He, think that he's, he thinks that he's made a victim, that he's caused a backsliding and a coldness in the church. And just when the enemy came in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raised up a standard of His holiness. He says, come on, my people, get your eyes on Jerusalem now. Come on, get your eyes off the world and look up your redemption, draweth not. You're not a victim of the devil. If all hell is loosened, if all hell, every demon in hell is walking on your country, in your nation, don't be afraid. I'm going to call you. I'm going to put a robe of righteousness on you. I'm going to set you free. You're not going to serve the power of the devil anymore. You're going to be a free people. Oh, I've been sensing the glory of his love in me. 
You see, that, that doesn't mean you still don't have infirmities of the flesh. You still have to fight the infirmities of the flesh. But you see, God took the rebellion out of you. The rebellious person in you died. That's what the Bible says. When you're, when you're saved, you're dead to sin. That, that means that, you, you see, when you're trying so hard to please God, now you can't do it because you have rebellion. But when you get the rebellion out of your heart, suppose that you come to Jesus and you say, Lord, kill me. And by faith, he does. He does what he said. God does what he says. Or he would be a liar. God says, when you come to me and confess your sins and believe in all your heart, that he destroys the body of sin in you. What he does, he takes out the desire to sin in you. Now, you still may have some lust in you, but you look at it, you say, I hate that, Lord. That's not for me. That's not for me at all. He changes. You still have the, you still have the ability to sin, but he takes away the desire to sin. That's what is killed, the desire to sin. That old desiring nature to do what the world does. He cuts the nerve of that so that even though the devil comes at your temptation, do it again. You say, well, I don't want to do it. And, and you'll feel a pull, you'll feel a tug. But there'll be something deep inside you. The spiritual man is in there now. The spiritual man is now fighting for you through the power of the Holy Spirit and says, hold still, I'm going to bring you through it. going to bring you through it. You don't have to do it. Hallelujah. I refuse to live as a victim of sin anymore. I've heard preachers say, I refuse to be a victim of poverty. Well, here's a preacher that says, I don't care about riches or poverty, but I refuse to be a slave of the devil to sin. I am going to be opening my heart to his righteousness and his holiness. And do you know he loves his children? Whenever there's something that rises up in your heart and you say, oh God, I see how weak I am. I see how helpless I am. And that's where he wants you. He doesn't want you to make him promise, I'll never do it again. You did that a thousand times and broke it. He doesn't want to hear that anymore. What he wants to hear of you say, God, I'm help. I can't be holy. You said, be holy. I can't do it. Impossible. And I tell you now, in a million years, if you had a million years to live, you could not be holy by anything you do by your own strength. Just by willpower. In the sight of God, there's no such as thing as willpower. Only his power. I've heard people say, well, I think I could be holy if God just helped me a little bit. You can't be holy even with God's help. Because God won't help you do it yourself. He won't lend his power to somebody climbs up like a thief and robber some other way. He said, there's only one way. You're going to bow down in the dust before me and say, God, I'm helpless. I can't be holy. You're going to come my way. When you come my way, I'll give you all my power and strength. You can be holy. I'll give you my holiness. I'll give you the holiness of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. You say, you mean you don't fight the devil anymore? Oh, I fight him, but I don't fight him on own strength. Now the Holy Ghost is with me. Uh, you you heard that that story, didn't you? Little girl said, "I give my heart to Jesus." Now, when the devil comes knocking the door, I said, "Jesus, answer it." You know, Holy Ghost, answer it. Holy Ghost, devil knocking, you answer it, and just tell him he doesn't live here anymore. He doesn't live here anymore. The Holy Spirit's bound the strong man, the devil, and cast him out and spoiled all his goods. Spoiled him. Spoiled. You know what it means to take away his kingdom. God said, I'll move in through the power of Jesus Christ in faith, and I'll get a hold of the devil by the neck, and I'll throw him out. Folks, don't you know the devil doesn't have any power except through the lies you believe he tells? He doesn't have any power over any believer at all. He can't do anything. You, you don't have to be afraid of him anymore. He has no power. He defeated at Calvary. He is done. He is finished. His kingdom is wiped out. You don't have to go around as a slave anymore. It's your own fault. You don't have to do it anymore. There are many people listening to me now. You say, David, I've been through that battle too. I've been up and down. And I've felt that God's angry at me. I've never felt at peace with God. I've never felt He really loved me. I never felt I lived up to His standard. And I'm tired of that. And there's some of you right now that are living as a victim to, to sin. And everybody that's sick of being a victim to sin, everybody says in their heart, David, I hear what the Holy Spirit's saying. I don't want to live as a victim. Said, I want a power over sin. I want his power. He won't give you your power. He won't anoint your power. He just does away with your power. 
And I'll tell you something, when God kills the old man, he even kills the old conscience. Your peace doesn't come from conscience anymore. It comes from God himself. The peace that Jesus Christ gives you. Don't get it from a conscience. Your conscience will cheat and lie to you. And his spirit comes. He gives you the mind of Christ and he gives you perfect peace. It passes all understanding. That you've been a slave long enough and he wants you to rise by faith. And it's only by faith. And you don't grit your teeth and say, give me faith. If you just hate your sin and come to him, the Bible says he'll give you the faith even. He'll even give you the faith. You'll sense it coming up as supernatural. And when you're confessing your weakness and your inability, suddenly the Holy Spirit comes upon you and he shows you the power of God. And then you lean back and say, Jesus, take over. Here's my life. Take over. And trust him that the same spirit that's on you right now is going to stay with you. The Holy Spirit, he said, he's going to be in you now. A well of living water springing up inside. It's going to spring up. Hallelujah. Some have got your well capped. You've got something blocking it. God's going to pull all that junk out. I'm going to unstop the fountain and let you praise him like you've never praised him in your life. Hallelujah. But folks, we are now... In a time in the church of Jesus Christ that is supernatural. In delivering people from their sins. You see, Jesus can't come until he delivers his people from their sins. He can't come. He said he's coming from.